In this video, we're going to be discussing the application of flywheels, which can be used to store and dissipate mechanical energy, or more specifically, kinetic energy, at different times during a cycle. Now, first of all, it's important to understand why we need flywheels and some of the applications where they might be used. So in the top left hand corner, we have a diagram which can be used to describe the four stages in the cycle of a four stroke engine. So the first stage in that cycle is known as the intake stage. And during the intake stage, we have a rotating crank pictured here. And as that crank rotates, we have a slider, in this case a cylinder, which is drawn backwards like so. Now as it's drawn backwards, as a result of suction, we're going to draw an air-fuel mixture into that cylinder. So in the chamber of the cylinder here, we're going to end up with an air-fuel mixture. It's similar to the drawing of a fluid into a syringe. As we reduce pressure, the air-fuel mixture is drawn into the cylinder. Now the second stage of the process is compression, and this time the crank is driving the cylinder forwards or upwards. Now as it drives the cylinder upwards, we're compressing our air-fuel mixture. So we're going to end up with a high pressure air-fuel mixture. The third stage is the power stroke. And in a petrol engine, we have spark plugs, and the spark plugs are used to ignite the high pressure air-fuel mixture. When we ignite that air-fuel mixture, it becomes very hot and it rapidly expands. And as it expands, it forces the cylinder back downwards. And the final stage is to remove the exhaust gases or the combusted air fuel mixture from the cylinder during the exhaust phase. So the cylinder moves up again and the combusted air fuel mixture is removed from the cylinder so that we can return to the intake stage. Now, there's a couple of important things to note here. First of all, that full cycle in a four stroke engine takes two revolutions. And the second important thing to note is of those four stages, the only stage where we're producing power is stage three, the power stage. During stages one, two and four, we're actually using energy. It takes energy to draw the air fuel mixture into the cylinder. It takes energy to compress the air fuel mixture and it takes energy to force the exhaust gas out of the cylinder. So underneath that diagram, we have a graph which shows torque on the y-axis against crank angle on the x-axis. These are often referred to as torque angle diagrams or turning moment diagrams. And what this shows is during those four stages, we have three stages where the torque is negative meaning it's actually taking torque to move through those stages. We have stage one, intake, requires torque. We have stage two, compression requires torque. We have stage four, exhaust, which requires torque. And the only stage where we're producing power or producing torque is during the power stage, stage three, pictured here in red. So what does this mean in practical terms? Well, the crank that's attached to our cylinder here isn't going to move with a smooth angular velocity. And in fact, the angular velocity would more likely resemble what we see on the torque crank angle diagram. We would expect the rotational speed of the shaft to slow down during stages one, two, and four. And we would actually only expect the shaft to speed up again during stage three. So what we would end up with is a speeding up and slowing down of that shaft in response to these kind of pulses of power. So we have a pulse of power, the shaft speeds up, and then the shaft begins to slow down between stages four, one, and two. Then we have another pulse of power, so the shaft speeds up. So we don't have a nice constant uniform velocity. So this is where the role of a flywheel comes in. And essentially all a flywheel is, is a disc of weighted material. So we might have our shaft, like so, and mounted on the shaft, we have a flywheel. 
like so. Now we know from earlier tutorials on inertia that it takes a certain amount of energy to get this flywheel moving. Imagine you're pushing a car, it takes more energy to get the car moving than to keep it moving, and that's as a result of inertia. Now by using the flywheel, during the power stroke, the flywheel is going to absorb angular kinetic energy, and during the remaining stages, it's going to slowly dissipate that energy. So larger flywheels have a much greater smoothing effect to reduce the fluctuations of velocity. And we'll look at some example calculations of this in a moment. But it's important to understand because a rotating mass has inertia, it takes energy to get that mass moving, but it would also take energy to slow that mass down. So we can use that to our advantage. We can absorb energy during the power stroke and we can re-dissipate that energy during the exhaust, intake and compression strokes. Let's take a look at how we would go about sizing a flywheel for a given application. So on the screen here, we have a torque crank angle diagram for a specific machine. And the first thing that we notice is that we have two stages, so between A and B and between C and D, where energy is being absorbed. And we have two stages where energy is being produced. So between B and C, which is represented by the quantity of energy A2, and between D and E, which is represented by the amount of energy A4. So the machine that's producing energy here is different from our four-stroke engine, because our four-stroke engine had three stages which were absorbing energy, and just one stage that was producing energy. Now in the top right-hand corner, we're also specifying that our rotational speed should never exceed 1250 RPM, and our minimum speed should never drop below 1120 RPM. So we do still have quite a broad range of speeds there, but if we wanted to narrow the maximum and minimum speed allowances, we would need to increase the size of the flywheel. Now the first thing to do is to look at something called the maximum fluctuation of energy for our machine. And the maximum fluctuation of energy is represented by two symbols, B to W like so. Now this can be determined by calculation, but what we're going to do is we're going to use our torque crank angle diagram in order to determine B to W, or the maximum fluctuation in energy. So we have max fluctuation in kinetic energy. So what it really means is what's the maximum amount that our energy can change by during that cycle? Now, in order for this to be a cycle, the torque at the start of the cycle, so the torque here on the left-hand side, Ta, must equal the torque at the end of the cycle here, Te. And it also follows that the energy at point A, or the energy stored in the system at point A, must equal the energy stored in the system at point E. Now, the amount of energy stored in the system is going to dictate our rotational speeds. But we're less interested in that for the time being than the size of flywheel that will minimise our fluctuations in between that maximum and minimum speed. So we can write the following. The energy at point B on our diagram equals the energy at point A minus A1. The reason that must be true is because the energy we had at point A is being reduced by the quantity A1 before we get to point B. So we can write another statement about the energy at point C because the energy at point C is the energy at point B plus A2. But we've already said that the energy at point B is the energy at point A minus A1 on the line above. So we can rewrite this statement and we can say that the energy at point C is Ea minus A1 which represents Eb plus A2. We can say something similar for the energy at point D because the energy at point D is the energy at point C minus the quantity of energy A3 
but we have a statement above for the energy at point C. The energy at point C was the energy at point A minus A1 plus A2. And from that we need to minus A3, like so. And finally, we can write a statement about the energy at point E because we know that the energy at point E is the same as the energy at point A. Let's repeat that process, except this time we're going to input our values of A1, A2 and A3. So we said the energy at point B was the energy at point A minus A1. So what we actually have is the energy at point A minus 45. And we said the energy at point C was the energy at point B plus A2. Well, the energy at point B is Ea minus 45. And to that we need to add A2, which is 110. We said the energy at point D was the energy at point C, so taken from the line above, minus A3. So we have Ea minus 45 plus 110 for the energy at point C. But from that we need to minus 85. And finally, the energy at point E was equal to the energy at point A. So now we can look at our maximum and minimum fluctuations from Ea. We're using Ea as our datum. So at point B, we're 45 joules below our datum. I'm just going to represent that by minus 45 joules. That's 45 joules below our datum. At point C, we have our datum Ea minus 45 plus 110 which actually means we're 65 joules above our datum. And at point D, we have minus 45 plus 110 minus 85. So at that point, we're 20 below our datum. So in order to work out our maximum fluctuation of energy, we need to use the two extremes. And the two extremes here are 65 joules above our datum and 45 joules below our datum. The difference between those two numbers, in this case, is 110 joules. Therefore, beta W equals 110 joules. That's the maximum fluctuation in energy from our lowest energy value back up to our highest energy value within that cycle. So let's make a note of that on our left hand side and then we can look at our rotational speeds and calculate something called the coefficient of fluctuation of speed. So the symbol for the coefficient of fluctuation of speed is the Greek letter phi. And that's our coefficient of fluctuation of speed. And the formula that we use for phi is as follows. It's our maximum speed, n max, minus n min, or the difference in the maximum and minimum speeds, divided by the average speed. So n mean. The first thing I need is my mean speed. So my mean rotational speed is the average between 1250 and 1120. And the easiest way to find that is to add those two together and then divide by two. We're looking for the center point between 1250 and 1120. And that gives us a mean speed equal to 1185 RPM. So now we can calculate our coefficient of fluctuation of speed because we know our maximum allowable speed is 1250. We know our minimum allowable speed is 1120. 
and we know the average of our two speeds is 1185, giving us a coefficient of fluctuation of speed equal to 0.1097, accurate to four decimal places. So once again, let's make a note of that value, and then we'll carry out our final calculation in order to find the moment of inertia of the required flywheel for this situation. Okay, the formula that we use in order to determine the moment of inertia of our required flywheel is beta W divided by omega squared times the coefficient of fluctuation of speed. Note that in this formula, the angular velocity is omega, not n. And this is actually the mean angular velocity that we need to be working with. But as it's omega and not n, we need to convert our n mean, which was our average rotational speed, from RPM to rads per second. We'll recall that our mean angular speed was 1185 RPM. And the conversion to get from revolutions per minute to radians per second is times the number of radians in a revolution, 2 pi, divided by the number of seconds in a minute, 60. We have covered this conversion in a number of previous tutorials. So converting 1185 RPM to rads per second gives us a speed equal to 124.1 rads per second. So now it's simply a case of plugging those values into our formula because we have a value of beta W of 110. That was taken from our torque crank angle diagram. We have a value of our angular velocity of 124.1, and we need to square that. And we have a value of our coefficient of fluctuation of speed of 0 0.1097, giving us a required moment of inertia of our flywheel equal to 0 0.0651, kilogram meter squared. It is important to note that if our allowable speeds were much closer together than 1250 RPM and 1120 RPM, then the required moment of inertia of our flywheel would be considerably higher. So just to recap, we was able to determine our maximum fluctuation in energy from our torque crank angle diagram, and that came out to be 110 joules. We then calculated our coefficient of fluctuation of speed using our maximum speed, minimum speed, and our mean speed. And finally, we calculated the size of the flywheel that would be needed in order to maintain the speed between 1250 RPM and 1120 RPM based on the amount of energy that was being provided throughout the cycle.